Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Jason Lipoyarvi. One of the things that I try to do in all my teaching, uh, regardless of course, regardless of topic, is I try to incorporate this sort of intellectual sparring, if you will, and together help train intellectual virtues and even moral virtues, which is part of the university education. Uh, and one way to do this, to hone these transferable intellectual skills is to study fallacies, is to study bad logic, bad argumentation as an indirect way of learning about good argumentation. So when you're good at detecting BS, you're more uh, likely to avoid it yourself. Those of you who actually take courses with me, you have a, an added, a special reason to pay attention to these fallacies that I'm about to introduce. Um, and the reason I'll reveal the reason at the very end. Whether you're studying ideas of love with me or um, cults, new religious movements, or dimensions of the paranormal, or the Chronicles of Narnia, or women, religion, and spirituality, or J.R. Tolkien and the religious imagination, or whatever. Logical fallacies is something that we'll be training throughout the course, in every lecture, in fact, regardless of content. As I said, these are transferable skills that will great you, greatly benefit you um, in and out of university. What is an argument? Well, an argument is a proposition that consists of premises and conclusions. Conclusion is where you're striving um, towards. And so premises A and B lead to C, which is the conclusion. Now, a valid argument means an argument where the prem premises genuinely do result in the conclusion that has been offered. The conclusion organically follows from the premises that, it, that preceded it. That's a valid argument. It's interesting or important to realize that you can have a factually incorrect argument which is still valid. What this means is that one or several of the premises is actually not true, it's false factually. But if they were true, your argument is valid. There is no logical contradiction or problem there. So that's a valid argument. A sound argument is a valid argument with true premises. So a sound argument is a stronger argument. Or logically, both valid and sound arguments are as strong, um, but persuasively, the sound argument has more leverage because it's not uh, built on false premises, which can be pointed out. There's a, uh, a scholar by the name of Bo Bennett. I believe he's a psychologist and he's written a book called um, 300 Fallacies or something like that. And I've kind of tweaked one of the uh, ideas in that book, slightly changed it a little. Expose an irrational belief, keep yourself rational for a day. Expose irrational thinking, keep yourself rational for a lifetime. Obviously, this is a bit negatively expressed. Uh, you, could, you could express it more positively as well. And I like to say love is not blind. So even in ideas of love, the course ideas of love, 
uh, we look at arguments. It's, love is not just about emotion. There are good and bad ideas about love. I've chosen 20 most common fallacies. I mean, it could be 30, it could be 40. And by most common, I, I, I mean that uh, combine these 20 probably make up about, I don't know, 70%, uh, it could be 50, it could be 80, a significant portion of bad argumentation that we witness on social media, even in our textbooks, even in the classroom. Speaking of the classroom, professors are not infallible creatures. I mean, we make mistakes. Uh, hopefully more often than not, we, we don't do it on purpose, but we're not perfect. We're finite human beings. So it's good for everyone, students in particular, to um, encourage practice a, a posture of learning that is not naively um, credulous, that believes on everything uncritically. On one hand, that's one extreme. But on the other hand is not categorically cynical either, disbelieving, distrusting everything. That's the opposite extreme and both are inimical to learning. The, here are the first 10. As you can see, these are in alphabetical order. Here are fallacies 11 to 20. We'll look at these each uh, one at a time. Starting with ad hominem or against the person. Many of these fallacies have Latin names um, and it's not a coincidence. Uh, uh, medieval scholars, scholastics, um, advanced our understanding of, of um, logic quite a bit. Um, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of fallacies that they coined um, and, and developed. So this is one, ad hominem, against the person. Other names, um, it's also known as personal abuse, uh, kind of smearing, questioning motives, guilt by association. These are all, all types of ad hominem fallacies. And it means that instead of addressing the argument, critiquing the argument, you attack the person making the argument. This is a form of lazy, very lazy reasoning. And, and it's something to be aware of. It's not just an an accident. It's kind of morally also questionable. Very smart people can do this out of ill will, unlike some of the other fallacies, which are really, really hard to spot and avoid. This one isn't. It's very easy to avoid it. Here's an example. Only monks, nuns, and other bigots believe there is any value in celibacy. Notice there's no argument against celibacy, just smearing the people who might believe it. And if you're one of these people, um, you're, you're guilty by association with these monks, nuns, and other bigots. Here's another example. Why would you believe in UFOs? So thinking of cults, new religious movements. Only a Texan would be such a fool. Yet another. Why would you read Narnia? Juvenile literature written by a Christian bigot. By the way, bigot doesn't mean anything usually. Um, it's just a, a label. And finally, I totally disagree with your reading of The Hobbit. What would you know as an atheist or a Catholic? Tolkien was a Catholic author, and so an uncharitable reader might say you have to have faith in order to appreciate it fully. Or alternatively, an uncharitable atheist reader might say, uh, well, your religious beliefs are distorting your pure appreciation of the works and you're reading into it meanings that aren't there. 
Secondly, this is appeal to common belief, also known as appeal to democracy, appeal to the masses or the bandwagon fallacy, mob appeal as well. This is the claim that when most or many people in general accept the belief as true, it's evidence for the claim being true. So because many people believe it, it must be true. Because many people disbelieve it, it must be false. It's a pretty weak argument. Obviously, many people do believe in truths, but they're true regardless of the number of people that believe in it. So truth stands on its own terms, regardless of advocates. How could you not believe in elves when millions of Tolkien fans believe in them, for example? The appeal to common belief or the mob appeal is a, it's a lazy form of thinking and, and, a, and a dangerous way to accept information. This is tricky because on one hand, um, trusting authority, experts in fields, um, parents and so on, there's virtue in it. Um, and so I believe many, many things, not really because I necessarily understand them or have proved them, but I trust the people who, who um, present these things. We're, again, we're finite people. We cannot be intimately uh, familiar with everything we believe in, although that is that is an incremental uh, pursuit or goal. History has shown that sometimes those who break away from common beliefs change history. That happens as well. There are multiple examples of masses believing literal falsehoods and uh, insofar as they believe them, they wreak havoc. Eventually they're unlearned and the damage is corrected. Um, but moving on, appeal to emotion. Number three, this is known also as playing on emotions and, or sometimes emotional blackmail, which could be a, a form of uh, an instance of the more general fallacy. Now, it's important to remember that emotion is not bad and appealing to one's emotions, to the other's emotions, has its rightful place. I mean, we're human beings, not computers. But notice the qualification in the description. When emotion is used in place of reason in order to attempt to win the argument, it is a type of manipulation used in place of valid logic. And usually when logic or reason would lead to a different conclusion. An example, you don't want to make me cry, do you? This is a silly example, but I once remember telling a person that I didn't like their habit of guilt tripping me. And the response was, stop it or I'll cry. <laughs> Here's another example. I have had an out of body experience and you can either believe me or hurt my feelings. Tolkien suffered so much as a child, losing both his father and his mother before he was 10. Imagine being that little boy. His opinions about suffering are spot on. This is very close to a different uh, fallacy called argument from trauma, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Appeal to law. This is very common. And um, when obeying the law is assumed uncritically to be morally right without justification, or when breaking the law is assumed to be morally wrong without justification. So this is a confusion of the moral and the legal dimensions and kind of collapsing them into one, that one being the legal dimension. So just because something is legal doesn't necessarily mean it's morally, morally wrong. We've seen many examples of uh, such, such um, in, in history. 
And there may be many examples still prevalent in society today. And also, just because something is illegal doesn't necessarily mean it's morally wrong. So you can have bad laws. You, societies can um, criminalize things that aren't bad in themselves um, or, and, and often do. Here's an example, obvious example, easy. I cheated on my partner or exam. Oh, we'll get off your moral high horse. It's not as if it's illegal. Okay, cheating isn't illegal anymore. In some, some societies, it still is. Um, but it's, it still may be morally wrong. And the same with cheating in exams or elsewhere. So I fabricated, fab fabricated the ghost photo. Same thing, get off your moral high horse. So C.S. Lewis agreed to marry Joy Davidman, despite not loving her romantically and living apart. Get off your moral high horse. This is historically true, by the way. C.S. Lewis did agree to marry his wife before they were romantically involved in order to help her stay in England. Today, we would call this immigration fraud. Number five, argument from offense or argumentum ad offendum. I just made that up. My Latin is rusty. Somebody could correct me. What's the correct uh, Latin? This is the fallacy when feeling offended is used to discredit the other person's argument. So it doesn't mean that you offend the other person. It means that you yourselves are offended and you take this feeling of offense as as, uh, as evidence for the other person being wrong, when they may be wrong or they may actually be right, and that's why you're offended. So you hurt my feelings. Please apologize for being wrong. Basically, this, is, this happens all the time. Or the claim that superstition is prevalent in India is racist and super offensive. Take it back or your claim that the majority of Tolkien readers are ignorant about religion is super offensive. Take that back. Number six, argument from trauma. Now, this is a new one. I haven't included this before, and I'm still kind of developing the correct terminology and my understanding of this fallacy. I have checked the Latin, so it is argumentum ad calamitatem, this is close to the Stockholm fallacy, which I made up um, from the Stockholm syndrome. You remember in the Stockholm syndrome, the person being kidnapped falls in love with the kidnappers or becomes very sympathetic to them, at least. And this happens. This is a psychological process that does happen from time to time. And and so we'll, I'll, we'll return to that. This is the false assumption. So our argument from trauma is the false assumption that experiencing a traumatic event results in expertise of the causes that, of that event or experience. Appropriate and justified feelings do not necessarily translate into correct ideas or the causes of those feelings. The portion within the brackets is my attempt to describe the Stockholm fallacy, which is actually, now that I think of it, um, a more general fallacy. And the argument from trauma is perhaps one um, instance of this more general fallacy. So just as in the Stockholm syndrome, the person falls in love with the kidnapper who's shown them kindness and grace and warmth. Um, so in a way, your positive emotions to that person may be justified and appropriate to some extent. It results in, or you use this feeling as a justification for false beliefs about that person. So that they're a 
good guy and this is legal or they should be doing this or my parents should be paying them $10 million or whatever. Um, appropriate and justified feelings don't necessarily translate into correct ideas of the causes of those feelings. Here's an example. I lived through a school shooting so my thoughts on gun laws are informed. Obviously false. They may or may not be informed um, depending on other factors, not the experience of living through a school shooting. That may um, inform it to some extent, but you may still be predominantly wrong in your beliefs about effective gun laws. Okay, another example would be, I feel really terrible for people who experience racism. Therefore, I know how to combat racism. Well, you maybe you do, or maybe you don't. Maybe your ideas of racism and how to combat it um, are lopsided somehow, distorted somehow. That's a possibility. The fact that you have justifiable and appropriate feelings of sympathy to people who have experienced racism, or if you have experienced racism, doesn't necessarily, it can, but doesn't necessarily mean that you have very clear or well thought out uh, opinions about racism. Number seven, begging the question. This is easy and most people recognize it immediately. It's circular reasoning, assuming the answer. You remember an argument consists of premises and a conclusion that follows it. Well, begging the question or a circular argument is an argument where the conclusion is actually already assumed or hidden in one of the premises. An example is the Bible says the Bible is true so the Bible must be true. And it begs the question, well, how do you know that the Bible is true? The belief that the Bible is true is actually the starting point here. It's a, it's a hidden conclusion that is presented as a premise, but really isn't. Another example would be, as a young man, Tolkien broke off his relationship with Edith, which he did, because they couldn't continue their relationship. This, is, this begs the question, I mean, why couldn't they continue their relationship? That's the whole, that's the whole, that's the beef. Um, another example, I used to live in uh, Tanzania for some time and I remember going to the bank, which was closed and the glass door had a piece of paper on it that had the text, the bank is, currently not open because it is closed. Manager. True story. Number eight, bulverism. This has been coined by C.S. Lewis. Sometimes it's called the psychogenetic um, fallacy. It's very close to poisoning the wells. So this is when you jump over the difficult step of proving that someone is wrong to speculating about how the mistake came about. So instead of doing the hard work of showing where the faulty argument is, you start to psychoanalyze, you start to speculate about how they made that mistake in the first place, a mistake you haven't proven exists. The name bulverism comes from the essay bulverism. There's a very good doodle uh, video on online which you can see. Um, Ezekiel Bulver is the name who realizes the power of this fallacy to manipulate conversation. Check it out. Here's an example. All white people are racist, but you just don't see this because you're white. Maybe all white people are racist, but that hasn't been proved. Um, rather, that bit has been jumped over to speculate of why the other person is wrong. Well, they're wrong because whatever reason. This is close to the fallacy of, the, of unfalsifiability, which is the 19th fallacy. We'll get there soon. Here's another example. 
you are absolutely wrong. And it's, be it's because you were never hugged as a child. Cherry picking number nine, known also as suppressed evidence or one-sidedness or slanting or argument by half truth. When only select evidence is presented in order to persuade the audience to accept the position and relevant counter evidence is withheld. The stronger the withheld counter evidence, the more fallacious the argument is. This is very difficult to spot sometimes unless you know more about the topic of discussion than your friend or the presenter or the professor or the YouTube star or the Instagram influencer or whatnot. So it's very difficult to um, expose someone who's cherry picking, especially the, the smaller the group is, the easier it is to get away with this. And, and, and so that's why scientific discovery proceeds through um, um, open discussion where a great many people can participate in the honing and the critiquing of the argument or the evidence. Here's an example. C.S. Lewis gave 90% of his book's sale profits to charity and went to church every Sunday. Therefore, he was always honest and forthcoming. Well, if you didn't know that, first of all, the first part is true. The premise is true. He did give up approximately 90% of his book sale profits to charity, especially widows and, uh, and single mothers. And he did go to church every Sunday, um, but he wasn't, as a young man, always honest and forthcoming. We know this um, now. Uh, he could hide things. And as you know, he even um, committed immigration fraud. He was, he was partner in crime. Another example would be a Scientologist. Um, who did the same, whoever, whoever that is. Or Tolkien's essays are full of wit and charm and compassion. He was a charitable man, never irritable or captious. Again, pretty true. His essays are full of wit and charm and compassion. And he was a charitable man, but he could be irritable and captious. Um, and he had sp long spells of this, this foul mood sometimes. And you wouldn't know it unless you know much about Tolkien and you've read his letters, very personal letters, where he's forthcoming about these, these flaws of, of, um, of him. I want to emphasize that the fallacy of cherry picking, like most of the fallacies, like isn't always morally reprehensible. I mean, Thinking is difficult. Uh, arguing is difficult. We don't always, probably, usually don't, um, argue deliberately, fallaciously, or use dubious tactics in our debates and disagreements. Um, must, much of it is just a result of the fact that thinking is difficult, and we're, we're finite human beings, and we have a lot to learn. So we need to be gracious towards others and to ourselves as well. Chronological snubbery is the second fallacy coined by C.S. Lewis. And this is the uncritical prejudice against the past in favor of the present or the future. Basically, wisdom died yesterday. Now, sometimes, later is better, but this is the uncritical prejudice that this is always so. For example, that's so 20th century. The fact that something is 20th century doesn't mean in itself that it's bad. I mean, it could be better than the 21st century depending on other factors. Another example would be Tolkien working in the 20th century was a better philologist than his mentor 
Professor Joseph Wright was, because Wright's literature, literary theories, literary theories were mainly from the 19th century. Obviously a bad example. He may have been a better philologist, but that cannot be solely um, or even primarily because he was working in the 20th, 20th century. Now we've gone through the first 10 and we've got 10 more to go. We'll start with 11, false dilemma, also known as the false dichotomy, either or language or black and white thinking. Very common and I'm sure you recognize it immediately. When only two choices are presented, yet more exist, or a spectrum of possible choices exist between two extremes, either or language. A variation of this fallacy would be false trilemma, when you give three choices, when more than three exist. Here's an example. I thought she was a good person but then I found out that she was a Jew or a Muslim or an atheist, as if you have to be one or the other, a good person or a, a religious person. That's a false dilemma. Or you're either for Gondor or against Gondor or the US or Canada. This is a either or fallacy, black and white thinking. Now, sometimes there actually is only two options. Sometimes you have to choose one of two uh, or one of three. The false dilemma is only a fallacy if there actually exists more than two or three or whatever. I remember a, a friend, an Iraqi friend who was almost in his twenties. I'm exaggerating a little bit, my apologies. When he learned that a Kurd, so a person from Kurdistan, northern Iraq, doesn't mean idiot, as his father had taught him. So a Kurd was just a, a label, a swear word. And then he realized that no, actually, um, idiot and Kurd mean different things. Genetic fallacy or the fallacy of origins comes close to bulverism. This is basing the truth claim of an argument on the origin of its claims or premises. In other words, if you know how a belief came to be, how it was originally developed, you will be able to deduce whether it's true or false which is nonsense. An example, Tolkien was brainwashed as a child into believing God exists. Therefore, God probably doesn't exist. The fact that someone is brainwashed to believing something that God exists or God doesn't exist or that two plus two is four um, doesn't mean that it's untrue. So you need to separate the the true, as this is just an example. Number 13, no true Scotsman or no true Christian, as it's sometimes called in, um, in Christian societies. When a universal claim, so every or all, is refuted by a counter example, rather than conceding the point and revising your argument, you dismiss the counterexample on some arbitrary ground. For example, no true Canadian is intolerant. Well, then you point out, well, this person is intolerant. And you reply, instead of modifying your claim and say, well, usually Canadians aren't intolerant or whatever. Um, you say, well, they must not be Canadian then. There are many, many examples. Um, a very technical example comes from Calvinistic theology. Calvinists believe that a person 
who is saved in the spiritual sense can never lose their faith. And so if you do lose the faith, it kind of proves that you were never actually a Christian or saved to begin with. That's no true Scotsman or no true Tolkien aficionado likes Game of Thrones, which is untrue. I have met him. Number 14, non sequitur, or that does not follow, invalid referen reference or derailment. And this is a really basic mistake. And some of the previous fallacies that we've talked about uh, um, can commit this fallacy um, um, as well, or in addition to the to, to a different. So the fallacies can be compounded. You can actually commit more than one fallacy at the same time. So this is when the conclusion doesn't actually follow from the premises. So an invalid argument. C does not follow from A and B. Very basic. My favorite example, and I always use this, the Laughing Buddha, which is a local bar in the city where I live in presently Sudbury, my home, the Laughing Buddha has the best beer in town and was voted number one in Northern Life, which is a newspaper now uh, discontinued. Therefore, the manager of Laughing Buddha should run for mayor of Sudbury. Well, the fact that you produce best beer in town doesn't mean that you should run for mayor in Sudbury. And maybe some of you think that this is not a fallacy, but um, I won't argue with you. I'll just m mention that I found out later that the manager of Laughing Buddha had actually not only run for mayor, had not not run for mayor, but run for parliament. But I assume that um, he was basing his candidacy on other merits too. Number 15, poisoning the well, which is easy. If you know what ad hominem, the first fallacy means, you know what poisoning the well means because poisoning the well is a preemptive ad hominem attack against someone, also called smear tactics or hit job or discrediting. Um, to, that is, you prime your audience, whether it's your classroom or whether it's your readership, if you're a journalist, uh, with negative information about the person in order to discredit their opinions. So take there's a presidential election or, or whatever, and there's three candidates. And, and you, as a journalist, if you're, if you're an immoral journalist, you start to write a, write a hit piece where you just try and discredit one candidate so that their policies and opinions won't be taken seriously. I hope I presented my pro-life position clearly. Now, my opponent will try to refute my arguments by the same old fallacious, incoherent, illogical arguments we have heard all too often. Or I hope I have presented my case against telepathy. Now my opponent will try to refute my arguments by the same old fallacious, incoherent, magical thinking we have heard all too often. That's poisoning the well. This should be reductio without the N. Reductio ad Hitlerum, argument to Hitler or argument from Hitler playing the Nazi card or the Hitler card. And this is uh, an attempt to make an argument analogous with Hitler or Nazi Germany. Um, and I should add, make a, when, when the analogy is actually quite weak. For example, you have concerns about immigration. Well, so did people in Germany in the 1930s. Therefore, you empathize with Nazi ideology. There's tons wrong with this argument, but one of them is argument to Hitler. This is lately, I mean, a 
it comes and goes. Sometimes it's overplayed too much and then you don't hear about it for a long time and then it comes back. Uh, it's important to know that it's not always a fallacy. So some, sometimes the analogy is super strong and justified. Uh, say, if Canada started building concentration camps for Jews, for example, um, that's a red, real red flag. The fact that some people might be concerned over immigration, be they indigenous or not, um, concerned over non-indigenous Im immigration or, or um, non-indigenous citizens concerned over Asian in immigration or whatever, necessarily in itself doesn't mean that the people are racist. They may or they may not, but you can have justifiable reasons to, ha um, to have concerns about it. An even more clever trick or tactic is the so-called Nazi card card, which is sec second level tactics. And this is a card that is often played after the Nazi card is played. So when somebody says, okay, you're a Nazi or this will lead to the Third Reich. Um, and then a, diff a person replies, well, oh, you're playing that Nazi card as an attempt to discredit them. Well, if the person playing the Nazi card actually had good reasons and justifiable reasons, if the analogy is actually pretty strong, then the Nazi card card um, is a, an attempt to derail uh, kind of the conversation. Slippery slope, 17, also called the domino fallacy or the edge of the wedge. When a relatively insignificant first event is suggested to lead to a more significant event, causing a domino effect with some horrible end. For example, if we legalize pot, soon every student will come to class high. Or if we legalize magic mushrooms, soon every student will join a cult. Or if we legalize pipe smoking in classrooms, Soon everyone will dress up as hobbits. These are all examples of, of slippery slope. Again, sometimes the slope is really slippery, is very steep. It depends on the context. So if I tell my children, for example, who are playing outside and there's traffic and I say, well, you know, be careful on ice or you might fall and a car might run over you. And they reply, they wouldn't, they're four and six. Well, maybe the six-year-old would. Uh, they reply, oh, dad, that's a slippery slope argument. That, that'll never happen. Well, it's not. It's actually possible that that would happen. It's not unheard of that that happens. It happens all the time. But if I say something like, you know, don't play outside, um, uh, you know, don't jump around too much or you might be hit by the helicopter rotors on their way to the local hospital or something. That's, it's very uh, improbable to say the least. It's a slippery slope argument. Actually, I jumped over several of the stages. The helicopter rotors should be the very last dramatic uh, end result. Straw man fallacy, number 18, very, very, common and again, not always done deliberately. Uh, sometimes we commit it because we don't understand the other person and we misunderstand it. But sometimes we almost deliberately misunderstand them in order to win the battle. So substituting a person's actual argument with a distorted, exaggerated or misrepresented version of the argument which will be very easy, like a straw man, very easy to collapse, to push over. A real man would kind of push back, fight against your attempts to topple them. An example, an atheist says, I don't believe in a God who upholds morality. And a theist responds, so what you're saying is that there is no right and wrong, that everything is permissible, including rape, no, that's, that's not their argument. Um, 
that's a distortion of what they actually believe. If you had a more nuanced, nuanced conversation with lots of back and forth in a charitable spirit, um, you might be able to critique the theistic position and the atheistic position with a little bit more nuance and precision. Okay, penultimately, second to last fallacy. This is really difficult. This is really difficult to spot. It's called the fallacy of unfalsifiability or untestability or pseudo theory. Now in science, a good theory or a theory that even merits the name theory um, is a theory that in principle could be disproven, could be proven false. There ought to be some criteria that if they are met, the theory collapses. Now, if there are no such criteria, if you literally cannot disprove and refute a theory or an argument, not because it's a very good argument, because, but because it's an unfalsifiable argument, then that should be a red flag that there, it's a pseudo theory. It's not really a theory. So this is confidently asserting a theory or a hypothesis that cannot be proven true or false. It's assumed to be true, but you can't really prove, disprove it, which means you can't really prove it either because there are no criteria. For example, we are systematically oppressed by structures in society or by spirits in society that entirely escape our notice. This, you know, this may be true, but how would we know if they escape our notice? How would we prove that it's not true? Um, how would we prove that it's true? What are the criteria? <clears throat> Finally, one of my favorite uh, fallacies, whataboutism, developed by the KGB in Soviet Russia. Uh, you hear it all the time, or whataboutery, a relative privation. This is close to the fallacies red herring and muddying the waters. Not quite. This is the attempt to discredit someone's position or character by charging, accusing them with hypocrisy and raising a different issue without actually refuting or disproving their argument. Oh, let's go straight to the example. Person A says, I worry about racism in society. And person B responds, well, what about free speech? What about? As, as if you can't worry about both free speech and racism simultaneously. You can't have more than one valid moral concern. Um, obviously, you, obviously you can, and that's, that means that's basically um, consistency. Or alternatively, somebody says, well, I worry about um, free speech in society. And person B replies that, well, what about violence and, um, and, and, and so on? Same mistake. The problem with this fallacy is that, um, and you see this on social media all the time, is that because it's so easy to accuse someone, you know, they're worried about something and you point out a horrific thing. In a, a silly example would be, well, I didn't like that the person slapped me. And somebody says, well, what about all the people who are being punched, not slapped? Well, yeah, punching is bad, but I still don't like the person slapping me. But back to social media, um, we become so weary of accusations, like, uh, and we're, we become so weary of this trick tactic, KGB tactic, tactic played on us that we quickly want to de denounce everything. So 
just in case, uh, uh, to make sure that nobody can accuse us of being sympathetic to whatever thing you forgot to denounce. And so we have these denouncement rights where everybody has to go and say that was bad. I mean, it's obvious that it was bad, um, but it's important to say it so that you, everybody knows that you are the good guy and everybody knows that you belong to the right side in history. It's a moral posturing really, what's it? And it create, and it's a lot of nonsense, no matter what side uh, commits it or where it happens. What aboutism? Finally, here are the 20 fallacies. And at the beginning, at the outset of this lecture, this recording, I promised that I'd tell you why they're relevant to my students who take courses with me, classes with me. What I like to do in all my classes is I like to deliberately commit a fallacy, at least one. I mean, I may commit more than one fallacy, but only one of them is deliberate or usually. Um, I make mistakes and I you know, call me out on my mistakes. One of them will be deliberate and I'll change it every time. And the idea of this is for you to kind of practice, like we said, practice the, the right posture between two extremes, the extremes of naive credulity and like categorical cynicism, pessimism, uh, distrustfulness. You need to trust people. Life would be intolerable without trust. But uncritical trust sometimes can wreak havoc, lead to calamitous um, effects. And so this will also help you become more aware of arguments and reasoning in your textbooks, um, not just in my classes, but in every class, um, on social media and the newspapers in lectures, in your conversations, in your own essays, when you write essays, little by little, you're training these intellectual habits. Think of them as actual muscles, like physical muscles. And you train them, you start with small weights, and little by little, you're able to lift uh, larger weights or, or train harder or longer or stretch better or whatnot. So think of intellectual virtues as muscles. <laughs>